Namaste and greetings. I, Ritika Sundar, a researcher at Entry, Impact and Policy Research Institute, Prabhav Ivamiti Anusandhan Sansthan, Nadali, warmly welcome you all to Entry hashtag web policy talk. Today, we have gathered here for a special lecture on the topic, Delta Vision 2050, Policy, Practice and People by Dr. Debjani Bhattacharya and Dr. Meghna Mehta. This talk is a part of the series, The State of the Environment, Hashtag Planet Talks, which is organized by IMPRI Center for Environment, Climate Change and Sustainable Development. Today, I deem it my honor to introduce the speakers. Dr. Debjani Bhattacharya is Associate Professor, Department of History, Drexel University in the United States. And Dr. Meghna Mehta is a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Sheffield, England. Welcome, ma'am. We're fortunate to have a distinguished discussant for today's celebration. Welcome, sir. Dr. Riazul Ehsan is Assistant Professor, Department of City and Metropolitan Planning, University of Utah, Salt Lake in USA. He's also the academic lead in Urban Ecology Program, University of Utah, Asia Campus, South Korea. We look forward to learning from our distinguished speaker, and eminent panelists, and we look forward to an enriching deliberation. With that, I invite Dr. Sunni Mehta, CEO and Editorial Director, IMPRI, New Delhi, and the moderator of today's session to take over. Welcome, ma'am. Thank you, Ritika, and good evening to everyone uh, from India. And um, so, yes, this is a very, very important topic, uh, which is Delta Vision 2050 policy practice and people, because all of us know that Sundarbans is the largest mangrove forest in the world. And it is actually home to over 4 million people who inhabit more or less 50, more than 50 islands that is spread across the sovereign territories of India and Bangladesh. But unfortunately, um, majority of the people live their lives under utter misery and poverty. The, these miseries are also worsened by the natural disasters and environmental extremes, which has been exacerbated by climate change. And this ultimately leads to a large scale migration and it has led to large scale migration from the islands to the mainland uh, in search of uh, decent work and also for shelter. And it turns them into environmental refugees. Uh, in fact, we are addressing uh, this whole concept of environmental refugees in a trans-regional context wherein we are looking at the Sundarbans Delta as well in the trans-regional collaboratory of the Indian Ocean, uh, which is a project that is uh, sponsored by the Social Science Research Council, New York. Um, so uh, to address the adversity that these people face, uh, the governments of India and Bangladesh launched the Delta Vision 2050 with the aim to improve the conditions of the people of the Delta and also to protect the Sundarbans. So what is this Delta Vision? What are the elements and in what ways does it translate to bringing a hope in the lives of the population of the Delta? Does it cater to the aspirations and promises a, a decent future? What are the challenges and where does the scope for future improvement lie? So to discuss this and beyond, we have eminent experts on the subject who have been studying the Sundarbans and the Bay of Bengal region for quite some time. Dr. Devjani Bhattacharya and Dr. Meghna Mehta as the speakers of the theme, Delta Vision 2050, Policy, Practice and People, and Dr. Riazul Ehsan as the discussant. So given the time zones, uh, differences in the time zones for um, several of you, morning for Devjani in the, in the United States, evening for us, um, Meghna and uh, us at IMPRI, and late night for Riazul in South Korea, I'm filled with gratitude for each of you for your participation. Once again, I welcome all of you on behalf of the IMPRI Center for Environment, Climate Change and Sustainable Development. I also welcome all our participants on Zoom and on Facebook Live. So thank you so much for joining us. I invite Devjani and Meghna to begin with their presentation. Thank you and over to you. Thank you so 
Uh, I'm really grateful for you for organizing this conversation today and for the invitation to speak. Um, there are actually so many incredible scholars of the Sundarbans, activists and experts who've been working in the region for uh, much longer than I have. And in some ways, it is really an honor to be able to share some of my thoughts because in comparison to many of them, I'm a new entrant to what is a very incredibly complex landscape. Um, and as an anthropologist, I also foreground a certain kind of knowing and understanding Understanding. And so I won't be able to do justice to the very many different points of views and disciplinary approaches to understanding the Delta, but I'm very excited to open this conversation further. So very briefly, I thought I would just begin by summarizing what the Delta Vision document is. Um, for those of you here who might not be aware of it, um, so that we can understand what is really at stake and what is it that we're discussing today in terms of um, the future of the Sundarbans. So as many of you are aware, the Sundarbans Delta is an important ecosystem and with West Bengal and Bangladesh taken together, it's approximately home to 7 million people. Um, and of course it has a very distinct cultural and religious history, um, as well as a unique landscape, which is one of the richest in biodiversity. Um, as part of a kind of global condition, the Sundarbans will witness unpredictable weather patterns with excessive rain, stronger cyclones, inundation, with saline water floods. But as you mentioned, um, Simi, there are many other vulnerabilities that have sort of existed in the Sundarbans um, and long standing vulnerabilities which um, predate the climate emergency that we're all living under at the moment. So the Delta Vision document of 2050 is a document that was actually written uh, by WWF in consultation with several experts um, and the School of Oceanography at Jadavpur helped in preparing it um, among you know, many others who put an input into it. There's a different document for actually the Bangladesh Sundarbans which was um, supported and written with the help of the International Union for Conservation of Nature. My focus today will mainly be on the Indian Sundarbans document um, but I'll sort of touch briefly on some of the similarities and differences of the visions of the Bangladesh and the, Sundarban, uh, the Indian Sundarbans. So very briefly, the WWF vision, vision for the Sundarbans is a four-phased plan where inhabited coastal fringes of the Sundarbans, um, they believe, ought to be emptied out of its current inhabitants. Uh, these populations, the vision hopes, will be absorbed by neighboring districts. Simultaneously, it proposes this, that these neighboring districts uh, develop infrastructures ranging from homes, hospitals, educational institutions to absorb these displaced populations. So the vision, after retreating these populations, would be to begin mangrove restoration such that erstwhile inhabited islands of small paddy cultivators, fishing communities be converted into mangrove forests, which would further, it will hope to be enmeshed in carbon sequestration and the selling of carbon credits in a global carbon market. Now, just to give you a sense of the scale that we're discussing, with regard to the Sundarbans is that this vision was written um, by WWF in 2010, which had initially approximated 1.3 million people as being currently at high risk from sea level rise um, and coastal flooding with a 2.4 million exposed to moderate risk. So we're approximately thinking about three to four million inhabitants um, and the majority of whom, as many of you will know, belong to lower caste groups, uh, scheduled tribe communities. They're very small landholders or actually landless and living on caste domain or land to which they only have squatter rights. So the ultimate goal of this vision that is proposed by the, the WWF vision, and I'll refer to it as the WWF vision, um, is to increase ecosystem services of this region, to further enhance and promote tourism, to encourage mangrove regeneration, which according to the vision, depends on the rate in which the population can be enticed, um, and it uses this word, counseled or motivated to move away. So the WWF vision strikes me in some ways as both anti-people as well as something that would be detrimental to both saving the natural ecosystem and the social, cultural and cosmological ecosystem that currently thrive in the Sundarbans. And while it is very commendable 
able to think about a future of the Sundarbans and to be able to begin to think what might happen to this um, unique landscape uh, in 30, 40, 50 years from now, um, I want to highlight the ways in which the current Delta Vision 50 fails to both account for preserving human and non-human life. So foremost, um, the WWF vision relies on a concept of nature, which believes that nature or biodiversity can be found in only some areas, such as national parks or protected sanctuaries. Research, I think, in the environmental humanities for decades now has um, critiqued this idea to save nature in certain pristine landscapes or thinking about wildernesses um, as a place which, um, in fact, exists in semi-urban settings, urban settings, in, in all kinds of rural and agricultural settings. And so the whole idea of protected parks and natural reserves or wildernesses has been heavily critiqued. And there are several people, people for decades who've been writing about this sort of slightly archaic notion of thinking of nature as quite separate from everything else. Um, and, you know, I, there, there, there are many scholars, but one uh, scholar recently, whose most recent book, um, Emma Maris, writes in, in the example in the US she gives is of wolves. And it was very resonant to me for the tigers and the Sundarbans, because in some ways, if we think of even the wildest animal in the Sundarbans, which is the Bengal tiger, um, it is radio collared. It has camera traps that exist all throughout the forest to be able to take photographs of its stripes uh, for a tiger census. The Wildlife Institute of India, uh, along with WWF, does scat samplings, DNA testings of these tigers based on some definitions of what might it be to be wild for freedom and autonomy. Um, and this is put forth by Emma Maris, our common city crow and sparrow might actually be less surveilled than the so-called wildest animal of the Sundarbans. And I think the scholarship also for, for many decades has really argued that human correlations and cohabitations with the environment needn't always be de detrimental, uh, but in fact might be quite useful in even allow for much stronger conservation targets. Um, and of course, there are many classic texts on this. One which stands out is uh, Melissa Leach and James Fairhead's Misreading the African Landscape was one uh, text which argued for the fact or showed actually through painstaking research how um, in Western Africa, what we thought of as a degraded savanna landscape because of um, population increase was in fact the opposite, that it was because of growth in population that made the forests more woody. And so they turned received wisdom on its head by showing that in fact, people really do help, of course, in certain contexts, certain kinds of people. But this notion that you need to depopulate or empty out our coastlines to regenerate mangroves is highly contested. And I think there needs a lot more research, both in terms of scientific research which melds itself with local expertise to think about what kinds of flourishing mangrove plantations um, uh, uh, will allow for in what, what context. Um, I think the Delta vision, uh, WWF vision of it is um, also foreground certain threats as being the overarching threats, foremost being of course rising seas and the effects of climate change. However, there are many other threats to this ecosystem which are unacknowledged by this vision. And these include a whole host of sort of pollution which is not a part of just the sort of in-situ delta itself. Um, and so a proportioning blame to communities living alongside it um, is problematic when we have ship vessels that transport oil, fly ash, coal in the waterways from the port of Kolkata to Dhaka, which have multiple spills, which all of us have read about, um, and for which there have not been actually impact studies uh, to know um, the effects of it. Uh, we know that there's noise pollution, that the oceans are hugely disturbed by the kind of anchors that these ship vessels leave. Um, there's, there's pollution from tourism, from luxury cruise ships, from the crude oil of diesel and fertilizers upstreams that are coming down. And, and I don't want to just list these as, um, as threats that we're all deeply aware of, but to really say that in order to genuinely think about what the Sundarbans is threatened from and by, we, we have to change the discourse of it being, um, being blame apportioned on local communities living alongside a forest. Um, 
which in fact is what the forest department conservationists spend most of their sort of emotional and economic energies on. Um, one of the things that the Bangladesh Delta Vision acknowledges in depth is actually the the threat due to the curtailment of freshwater flow from the rivers. Um, and these rivers, both in India and Bangladesh, have been dammed. There's the Faraka Barrage, which has been written about extensively by several scholars who study um, the Meghna, Brahmaputra, and Ganga Delta to show that a curtailment of freshwater flow and the increase in salinity levels is actually um, will cause biodiversity loss in, in this really fragile ecosystem at a much faster pace than, than anything else that um, that you know that in terms of these inhabitants the communities that live alongside the delta could could be doing so. So in some ways, I've tried in a few minutes to highlight that even at an aspect of the ecosystem and the flora and the fauna of the ecosystem, the delta vision doesn't. Um, isn't taking actually bold steps to acknowledge what could be threats. And I think Debjani after me will speak a lot more about threats that are even further away from, from the, the Delta itself. But briefly, I also did want to move on to the aspects of, of the lives of Sundarban residents that this vision um, is planning to have them retreat or to move away from these coastlines. Um, so moving people from the Sundarbans to protect them from the rising seas assumes a very narrow notion of what it means to live. Um, residents of the Sundarbans, be it small scale paddy cultivators, owners of local transportation within the island or fishers, honey collectors, crab collectors, have a relationship to home have a relationship to the landscape and to the village community. And this particular relationship, be it to the mangroves, to the river, to agricultural cycles, have provided certain skill sets, certain forms of knowing, working, and doing, um, which has cultural and cosmological associations. There are relationships to community, to neighborhood life, to um, village pujo committees, credit and debt systems, um, local government, relatives, kinship forms. Um, and this is crucial and should not be taken for granted because home is about celebrating festivals and village life, but it is also about having a support system which most migrants are devoid of um, in unknown cities, in foreign languages, where labor laws um, are, are, are not strong as we know in the informal sector in, in India. So the relationship to home and to land, um, and not only just to, I mean, a lot of it is not land that they own themselves actually. And so the Delta Vision assumes that this community off their land, get a one-time benefit, um, kind of creating landlessness of communities that are actually very landless already and, and have squatter rights only to these lands. Um, the document itself actually acknowledges that 5% of the population that was interviewed through, um, the, I mean, the the, there was a large number of people who were unwilling to move out. And it admits that in order to empty out coastlines, people will have to be counseled, enticed, given financial compensations, motivated by economic incentives, um, as well as through infrastructures of hospitals and educational institutions. And currently the Sundarbans does not have healthcare infrastructures. There are almost no hospitals, very few primary healthcare centers even. So in the past decades of the situation in the Sundarbans hasn't sort of changed in terms of investments in infrastructure and healthcare. Um, and if indeed education and healthcare are conceived of as reasons that might motivate populations to move out, then perhaps we can step back, pause and think that these opportunities and infrastructures could exist or could be made to exist for residents that have current homes there and that already live there with these longstanding vulnerabilities. Um, the last few points are that, again, it sort of brings in this first idea of a notion of nature, which um, is, is thought of as in wild spaces or in pristine natural reserves. And this idea that 2.5 million people might just be absorbed in the neighboring district uh, where new infrastructures ought to be built for them. There are major problems with this idea. I mean, one, which is that the current residents of these neighboring districts themselves suffer from several uh, poor social indicators. There aren't enough jobs and infrastructurally with water tables falling, um, agriculture is suffering, there's ad hoc sewage. 
So in some ways, the idea that these areas don't need to be protected, there are semi-urban mangroves, there are wildernesses and ideas of, you know, important species of plants and birds and actually paddy um, in these, in these um, semi-rural or semi-urban or peri-urban um, scapes of West Bengal. And the idea that this might just be made a dumping ground to absorb 2.5 million people with some new infrastructure. Um, firstly, this new infrastructure would be most welcome even for the current residents there right now who don't um, have sufficient um, and proper sanitation and hospitals and educational opportunities. And Yes, these districts might not be districts where a royal Bengal tiger is walking around or that it is a, not a global conservation hotspot, but, but these are also uh, parts of nature. This is also something that ought to be preserved and uh, conserved. And we need to actually think of a much more radical, holistic notion of nature as being everywhere, including in our cities, including in semi-urban areas, uh, without trying to separate it out um, and only being found in, in you know, places like the Sundarbans. Um, and I think just the last few minutes, I'd like to say that the that um, a cost-benefit analysis of thinking about the Sundarbans, which is what the Delta Vision document does, um, along with another document written by Dr. Nilanjan Ghosh, who's an economist who has um, thought about um, the, the, the ways in which the Delta Vision 2050 might yield fi a better financial grounds as compared to no intervention or as business as usual, as they call it, um, is problematic. And actually commoditizing nature um, and putting an economic value on nature, enmeshing and enfolding people into capitalist markets of consuming, buying, and selling to save nature is probably what has put us into the kind of ecological crisis that we're currently in. Um, so a proposal that allows for a valuation of nature, which is purely economic, I think is deeply problematic. And in concluding, I'd like to say that a vision is really important for the Sundarbans. And I think we can think about a vision which um, does allow for creative ways in which people um, can uh, think about you know, dignified labor, uh, better homes, which would allow for uh, cyclone resistant roofs or raised platforms. Um, there can be ways in which hospitals and educational institutes are provided for where people live because often, I mean, and as we know, there is out migration taking place and it has for decades and people are leaving the Sundarbans um, who have the means. And, and Devjani and I, perhaps in the discussion, can talk further about certain choices for people who would like to leave and who, who do feel that. But the motivations for them to leave are actually, in fact, trying to find better education, trying to have better healthcare opportunities and better jobs. Um, and so in some ways, if there were ways in which the Delta Vision might be interested in bettering the lives of the Sundarban residents, it, it could do so by improving labor laws in India because half of the households of the Sundarbans actually do have people who already migrate either seasonally or uh, work in factory shop floors. And many of them after two or three years in a factory shop floor return back home for to, because it's actually the conditions are so miserable. And so are we trying to create a vision in which there are many more people who we find working in, um, you know, sort of working overtime in construction sites without labor safeguards. Um, so yeah, emptying our coastlines, returning um, forests back to mangroves and uh, in sort of enfolding people into ecosystem services is a vision which would um, not necessarily, it would allow for more marine corridors, more tourists, more trawlers, um, but might not be the vision that, uh, that might be a vision that would be authored by, by very different people either, um, I think one step the Delta Vision WWF could take is by actually inviting in more stakeholders and by making it truly consultative by having interdisciplinary scholars, but also intellectuals and thinkers, fishermen and farmers of the Sundarbans itself might conceive of a better vision for themselves uh, for their future. And, and hopefully we can discuss what that might look like as an alternative in the discussion. Thank you. And over to you, Devjani. Sorry for taking a little more time. 
No, absolutely not. So thank you very much for setting the context so well and for also making a case for the need to cons save, conserve and also protect the pristine Sundarbans and the people there. So thank you so much. And I would like to invite Devjani to share her views. Over to you, Devjani. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Simi, for organizing this, for bringing us together and uh, for actually talking, uh, giving some space to think about the Delta vision about the Sundarbans, about the cyclones and the people. And I'm really, really excited to be again chatting with Meghna about this, something we do on a quite regular basis. But I'm also very, very excited to have Dr. Riazul Hassan to uh, think, help us think through this. So uh, so I will. what I will do is, you know, I'm a historian and I'm not an anthropologist. And I will be very honest, I don't, I'm, I'm, I don't spend time working in the Sundarban in the immersive way that uh, Meghna has done. So a lot of, that I know about what is happening at the moment are things I've learned from my colleagues, including Meghna. Uh, I'm a historian, so I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to zoom out, but use some of the uh, context setting that Meghna did beautifully to, uh, to think about how I'm zooming out. Uh, so let me begin by saying what was very heartening about the Delta Vision is this whole attempt that we rarely see in India is to work with India and Bangladesh together. That the fact that they can conceptualize something an ecological space that actually challenges our national borders is really, really important. So I want to commend uh, both the Delta Visions and each of the Delta Vision, but more so the Bangladesh one, I think, mentions, uh, which comes uh, two years or three years, four years after the uh, WWF Delta Vision. Where, and I think that it's also interesting where Bangladesh government has actually stepped up and set, uh, put in funding to do that, whereas in India it comes out of a conservation uh, NGO, uh, a global conservation NGO. But what they do is to say, you know, there are scope for working together and it is absolutely necessary that the Delta Vision has to be conceptualized as a two nation, like as a, as a, where the ecology over the nation state and sovereignty and borders uh, become important. So having said that, I think there are four, I want to discuss four things, I think, which are up for con uh, conversation uh, in, in the Delta Visions. Uh, and I think Meghna mentions one of them, that's something that we've been a little both troubled by thinking through, uh, have written a little bit about it, and that is the whole managed or planned retreat from the emptying the delta, which is primarily in the Indian side. Uh, the stress on the emptying out is on the Indian or the WWF Delta Vision, as we know it. So I want to begin with uh, the first point I want to make is I want to talk about the what Meghna just sort of highlighted, and I just want to draw say a five few things about it is what we see is there are multiple economic arrangements that are jostling in the, uh, in the, in the Sundarban about why people stay and why people leave. Uh, and what, what the Indian side does is the Indian sides actually thinks much more through cost benefit analysis, what they call the ecological economic evaluation framework. And the Bangladesh side mobilizes a slightly different language. It is a language of ecosystem services. So what that does is, and we've seen, like if you go back and look at the history of plant retreat is, uh, the way this whole eco um, ecological or cost benefit analysis is set up is the threats are often thought of in terms of cyclone and property damage and livelihood damage. That is a thread that is used on one side to do a cost benefit analysis on what are, the, what are going to be the benefits of moving the population out. And when that happens, what, what we see is we do not talk, think at, at all about the various kinds of other kinds of threats. And Meghna has worked very much. We've put a, one of the articles that Meghna published just today about the license culture and the rentier culture as another kind of economic thread that the uh, islanders live with, the various kinds of political corruption, violence. These are completely erased out. So when we have a model to do this four phase planning of moving, uh, moving people out of the Delta and ma mangrove regeneration, but our entire model is uh, uh, developed by eclipsing the various other kinds of threats, both economic. Uh, and if you just focus on the economic as Meghna very eloquently said, like uh, valuing nature through a commoditizing uh, framework is actually not very useful. But the, on the other hand, even when we do the economic valuation, we just only focus on the property and cyclone damage, whereas there are all these multiple kinds of economic uh, marginalization and threats that people face, which are not part. So what we might end up doing is we might transport these economic vulnerabilities into the new places. And how do we actually come up with a framework that uh, looks at the range of threats and 
if we were to look at the range of threats that the people face, do we come to a very different kind of solution is a question I think is open for discussion. And one of the things I think of, and Meghna spoke like uh, about the way to think about not just physical infrastructures, but building social infrastructures, about kinship communities, strengthening those education, health services, uh, empowerment pro pro uh, projections, because one of the things we see is every time the question of, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that, forced or top-down relocations have happened. People who have really benefited and been able to make good of this top-down uh, top kind of movements out of a certain place are people who are uh, so upwardly mobile, have a uh, economic, are economically empowered, whereas the people who are not have actually uh, gone down the scale every time there has been a top-down kind of a movement out of a place. So I think it is very, very important if we are looking at, at some point, that the people uh, might have to move. I think it has to be a voluntary kind of a movement where people are actually taking decisions based on the various kinds of availability. Otherwise, it might be, as Meghna pointed out, is we are going to remove this population and feed them into uh, informal uh, 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 informal structures of work, which are deeply violent. And uh, I think from what I learned from Meghna's work is so many of the people who've done out migration, which is often used to make a case for planned retreat, have actually come back. And of course, COVID should act, transform our whole argument. And here I want to flag Chinmay Tumbe's work, India Moving, which actually tries to look at why people move and how, why they move in, in their multiple contexts. So I think it is to think of the multiple economic arrangements that define life in the Delta and not to focus, uh, not to use just cyclone and sea level rise as one of the economic threats uh, through their property damage calculation to do this calculation. So this brings me to my second point. And here, uh, and this is the point about climate emergency. I want to make and I want to think through and it is not just something I saw in the Delta vision but as an environmental historian it is all over the place Every, mainstream writing um, uh, mainstream writing environmental history classroom textbook material climate emergency uh, is like the kind of a threat under which we are working and we know uh, the COP26 is happening we, we we actually are sitting here the earth system is tipping there is we have 20 to 30 years sometimes even not that to fix the course. So there is this kind of an emergency mode in which we are operating. And, and I, I have some reservations about this, um, the privileging of this climate emergency mode. And I'll tell you what are the kind of uh, things that there are three things I feel emerges when we operate out of this climate emergency mode and use that as a framework to push through certain kinds of arguments. We all know the history of emergency, whatever they may be. And I have worked a little bit on that uh, in my previous book, like emergency allows for certain kinds of provisions, certain allows governments to do certain kinds of things that would not be possible within a democratic setting. So climate emergency, as we see, actually allows for a tunneling of a vision where, and this is exactly what I was talking about, the multiple um, uh, economic arrangements and what Meghna does. It's like we are, uh, the emergency and the threat is sea level rise and uh, the uh, and the loss of mangrove cover as a buffer against um, uh, buffer against protection. Um, so what we need to do is we uh, the immediate as hard as it will be, there will be costs as over and over again, both the reports point out, there will be costs, some but will we have to bear it, but we have to actually oh, empty the uh, Sundarbans. And so this tunnel vision becomes sort of normalized in some ways. Uh, when we think about, uh, when we work operate through this kind of climate emergency, because the whole argument is we do not have time. So we have to continue, we have to go through and do certain things quickly. That's one point. The second is the Malthusianism. And uh, I think uh, Nilanjan Ghosh's article directly quotes Malthus uh, in slightly, not without a critical kind of a stance that scholars within humanities and social science have been using Malthusianism. And there is a deep Malthusianism in the Delta vision, what has what we've done is, and what I mean by that, what we've done is we have kind of naturalized the language of human habitation as an adverse impact on forest and biodiversity. We have actually used a term that comes out of the deeply racist and problematic politics of Cold War US of population bomb to constantly mobilize a language of population pressure and where what we do is when we use a climate emergence and population pressure together, we actually are able to very successfully erase that history. So what happens when we talk in terms of population pressure on the ecosystem, we actually forget that there is a mutualistic relation. And 
Meghna actually points out by, through Melissa Leach's work on misreading the African landscape. As, and also I think a lot of people, Meghna's work, Anu Jale's work uh, that shows that forests are products of human labor. So we forget that forests are actually products of human labor. We need the people to be there for us to have the forest. So the mutualistic relation is uh, forgotten. And then there's a two second point I want to make. When we think in terms of our Malthusian population pressure, we end up singling the human in situ. And we say they are actually responsible. And if we move this human from the mangroves, we will save the mangroves. What that does is that forgets the human activity which are away from the mangroves. And here I want to talk about the city I am sitting in currently and uh, how I actually have an impact. My daily life has an impact on the Sundarman. Philadelphia's entire waste recycling system, and I'm using Philadelphia, it would actually be the entire East Coast. Uh, entire waste recycling system from the 1970s is based on the availability of uh, <clears throat> South and Southeast Asia is a place where they can do their waste recycling. So the uh, more and more the global North is exporting its waste to the global South, which is creating various kinds of runoff and population and all across in the Bay of Bengal area is linked to this entire waste recycling neo-colonial regime. That's one and we know very intimately Rink and the Bangladesh um, uh, Delta Vision actually talks about the effects of uh, ship breaking that happens on the coast uh, yeah, on the Bangladesh coast and how the materials, the PCB and the pollutants are leaching in and uh, resulting in ocean acidification, in oceanic pollution. And for that, we really need to again go back and look at the Delaware River. It's very, and uh, Lindsay Bremner has done interesting work to show how when US uh, uh, instituted laws to keep, uh, make ship breaking environmentally clean, which would be extraordinarily expensive, a cost benefit analysis was done. And the cost benefit analysis said, let us uh, get the global south, which is poor and needs jobs to get them to do the ship breaking. And ghost ships started appearing in the Chittagong docks and along the uh, Sundarban. And so that is happening. So to keep the Delaware clean, and I'm just using this as an example, and we can use our multiple river systems uh, in the global north. To keep them clean, we have sh uh, shipped out of the these waste industries to the global south. So once we actually move away from a Malthusian view and looking at humans in situ, we realize this uh, through a planetary scale about how exactly the Sundarban is threatened. And I think these should be factored in when we do some sort of a modeling on how to save the Sundarban. The second point about the climate emergency mode is what I'm calling the economics of carbon. And this is really, really important to think through. There is a particular economics of carbon at play. So what do I mean by that is, as we know, we are one of the things we are doing uh, over the last, maybe since the Paris uh, COP um, uh, COP is uh, um, to think about how do we turn the underdeveloped parts of the global south as a carbon sink so that the global north can continue business as usual. So when we mobilize the language of business as usual, it's not possible for Sundarban. We never say that business as usual is not possible for a single family home who lives in Texas in a giant family with two cars and 500 fridges. So it's, it's that, it's the car, how do we turn this in a carbon sink? So what, is, what are they doing is Bangladesh and the Bangladesh um, uh, uh, Delta Vision actually goes quite deep into it. They are saying there are all, they're going to be all these methods of infrastructural building, biodiversity protection in the Delta. And where are they going to come from? They're come, going to come from two sources. One is the CCTF, the Climate Change Trust Fund. And the other is REDD+, which is redux, reducing emission from deforestation and degradation. And they're all very good. I'm not, I have nothing against it. We have to think through these uh, issues. But what I know is uh, there has been some studies already coming out of the Caribbean countries and Africa. And again, Melissa Leach's recent book called Carbon Conflicts shows it very well is when we are doing this top down carbon sequestration, pro sequestration projects in local communities and her work is on Kilimanjaro area. What we see that these projects of carbon mitigation end up tightly being linked to this whole fortress conservation projects, which sort of uh, where urban elites sitting in Calcutta, Delhi will benefit, local elites in the Sundarban will benefit, but it will lead to further marginalization of people we call the forest dependent, who we have to wean out of forest activities. So that will result before we even move the population, we are going to make them even more economically vulnerable before we even move them. So what like we are bringing in, we're going to move population who we've made through our projects of greening and carbon sink production, even further economically vulnerable. The third, so this is my second point on climate emergency and I have two more points to make and I will quickly end. 
So one of the points I want to make is like I, as someone who works in India and work has done long uh, over the last maybe 10 years has worked on a longer history of land uh, dispossession and displacement because of uh, development led projects, development induced displacement. Every time we think in terms of planned retreat and planned relocation, my, my historical um, uh, work actually makes me shudder. And I will, I will just say that because you know it has not gone well. We have not been able to do it well. Let us face it, every kinds of land displacement and, and here I think um, 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 the, the, there's a whole host of work who's looked at development and induced displacement all across central India, northern India and primarily on dam and the factory building. I, I, I leave with that, that but the, as the statistics goes, I think 70% of the people uh, who've given up their land for India's development have come from the scheduled tribe or are the indigenous population of India. And we might see a similar kind of play thing at play when we start thinking of planned relocation of people out of the Sundarbans. And one can never forget that this is a, this is a landscape which has lived through in the West Bengal side, lived through the violence of the 1979 Mari Chapi Institute when uh, Mari Chapi incident where which which is a living memory at least in the uh, in the sundarban although there has been many many efforts to actually keep it erased and out of public discourse uh, mainstream public discourse of general india marriage happened, happened uh, when um, the lower caste um, ref uh, refugees were from uh, who had felt that the, with the coming of the left front government the promise of getting land they actually end up coming from dondokarono in orissa to 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 the sundarbans uh, of course that was a place that the government had uh, allocated to develop coconut plantations it was also supposed to be a forest so there was a violent uh, eviction and the island was completely emptied out so if we were to go to a place which has a living memory of morid chapi and see, we are going to again do a uh, uh, planned relocation in four phases. I'm not sure how that would work. I, I think something that's to be thought about. But I want to end by thinking through a couple of planned relocations that have happened, managed retreats that have happened. And that will be the last point I make. And I'm sorry, I, I hope I'm not going over time. So one of no, the, the <laughs> so one of the planned retreat, and I, and I think it comes again out of University of Delaware has done a lot of research. And I know that Professor Danda and Professor Ghosh has been working very closely with University of Delaware in the kind of, you know, the, the, the multifaceted climate threat modeling and developing this uh, cost benefit analysis. So uh, we know that post Hurricane Sandy, the low lying Beachwood community, which was in Staten Island, which used to be a floodplain, but in the 70s, a bunch of corrupt land developers developed that property and people moved in there. Uh, and it is a white borough. It, is a, it was a white um, kind of a district division in New York. They actually lobbied and worked with their councillor right up to the highest level in the New York state to move out of uh, Beachwood community, and that has now been what they call the they call it the process of unbuilding the South Shore and the uh, to protect it from future storms. So the Beachwood community has been emptied out, and that has often and Liz Kosloff has done excellent work on it, documenting the entire process of how that has happened and the movement of the people away to higher grounds in um, northern New York, I believe, north of New York City. And this is a successful uh, managed uh, retreat uh, in North America. It's often used as an example. But what is very central to it is we are talking only, uh, New York is a very diverse city with a huge black population. And the only successful planned retreat that we end up talking about is of a white population. If we turn our attention away to New Orleans and look at Isle de Jean and uh, Anne McClinton has done, done work on that. This was a small island that where uh, the uh, indigenous tribe, tribe of Biloxi Ch uh, Choctaw tribe live. And it is, um, it is a place that like the Mari Chapi people, they were on a very early in the 18th century displaced into New Orleans area away from the Mississippi, which was being turned into cotton plantation. And later in the early 20th century, the oil industry destroyed the Martian. And there has been efforts because it is a toxic area to move this population out and they have resisted any kind of government intervention. And they've only demanded money to be allowed, make their marshy lives as they call it possible by which they mean money for a different kind of boat system and money to raise their house annually or biannually uh, to be able to, and they say we can live with the storms as long as we are allowed. So what I've done is I've just wanted to put this uh, couple of points in the mix as we discuss what, what does it mean to think through a wide variety of climate vulnerabilities and climate risks and multiple kinds of economic arrangements in the place? What does it mean to think about um, a Delta vision that is not 
so infused with the Malthusian ideas of population bomb and population pressure, how do we actually place our planned retreat in the longer history of the history of displacement or development induced or climate induced displacement, top down displacement, at least in India, and then to think about why certain kinds of land retreats succeed and what are the reasons certain kinds of land retreats fail. And I'll end here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dev Jani, for this wonderful uh, presentation and also for explaining to us the uh, intricacies of this uh, Delta vision from the lens of a historian. So very, very, uh, we, we really appreciate that. Actually, when you were talking about the COP26, uh, we have uh, with us uh, Dr. Jinia Mukherjee, who's watching us live on uh, Facebook. Yeah, she's from IIT Kharagpur, you know her. So um, she has just mentioned that you'll be happy to know that in COP26, the RCC Munich exhibited their documentary on three stories of adaptation, demonstrating the global South. And perhaps she expresses the hope that this is the beginning, and at least it is the it there is a beginning. So with this, I would like to invite Dr. Riyazul Ehsan to share his views. And sir, over to you. Please unmute. Thank you so very much. I was surprisingly listening to all of them. And I I just give me one quick second. I like to thanks Dr. Megna. Uh, that's a perfect postdoc. You have so detailed analysis. This this is for the first time I find some someone perfect postdoc who have every details. And Dr. Devchen is something as like uh, uh, so informative, and I really don't know from where I should start. So I did my PhD on climate migrant, especially in Shundarbon. John. So Shundarbon and the people on that part was firstly high. It was like as Dr. Megna you said, like. The relation of Bangladesh side, people and Shundarbon is like ecosystem service because these people get all their livelihood from Shundarbons. Not only the people living in that coast area, but the whole of Bangladesh because major business is after the garment sector is fishing, the shrimp culture, which is fully dependent on saltwater shrimp culture it's from Shundarbon and then honey and all others, cosmetics products to housing products. So Shundarbon is itself a whole ecosystem serves of sustenance of Bangladeshi people. And you'll be happy to know that my home, because I don't live in Bangladesh for a long time, but when I was, it's like one hour drive from my home to expect in Shundarbon. So I live very best. So my sustenance and my, maybe my forefather's sustenance has come from Shundarbon as well. But Shundarbon and the climate issues and displacement first come in Nitish after the Cyclone Isla, and Cyclone Cedar. Cyclone Island Cedar take place one after another, concurrent time. And at this in time, people start migrating. And that's the first time people focused, oh, Shundarbun is, before that, they don't really care about much of migration who are coming because Bangladesh side and economic side, they have in common tendency to understand that those type of migration are seasonal migration. Those poor migrants come to city, earn some money and go back home. And then during the season, they become Bawali. I mean, who collect honey from the forest and local town called Bawali. So they go there and collect the honey. And during the dry season, they come to city. So it doesn't matter. But after Isla and Cedar, they found that, you know, they are forced to migrate because there are nothing to survive. And at that point, they found, as we also say this one, there's a political watersh watershed boundary between India and Bangladesh, the Ganga, Brahmaputra, and when the water level is low, the soil salinity increase. Even the arsenic level increase so high, there is no fresh water supply. Till now, there is no fresh water supply. And that's another reason. When there is no fresh water supply and uh, salt or shim culture, stop production, any kind of rice. So the, those and fresh water fishing. So those people who are living with fresh water fishing and agriculture production, because we all eat rice. That's what the Bangladeshis are. And this West Bengal people, we, we can think ourselves for a day without rice. I don't know. After leaving Australia 25 years, I still can't think myself without rice. That's, it's in my blood. So those people who are producing rice, uh, they are farmer, and they have no other alternative but to leave that place. Because generation after generation, they are connected with rice, or peri, peri farming. And then when the soil salinity increase so high, 
they has to they have to migrate and after ilis become very highlighted and that's a part of like when the uh, delta vision the I, wwf is talking is relocating the people on the contrary iucn is talking how the economic loss will happen because sundarbon is a part of our everyday sustenance and it'll be surprised that delta vision we're talking 2050 the same delta vision for bangladesh world bank is saying delta vision 2100 and after talking it's see me as like looking where i can get the most and this is like in my hand i just got it this afternoon that bangladesh has changed a little bit of their plan is no more 2050 the report published by iu since 2050 but bangladesh is getting fund from world bank and trying hard and World Bank says it should be 200 and 2,100, that another 50 years. And in their report, they are saying, if you don't do right now, Delta Vision Plan, by 2031, that overall GDP will reduce around 6.8% in Bangladesh. And by 2041, that will be another 5.6%. And almost uh, officially, almost 20, uh, I have here uh, 25.1 million people, including the Shundarbon area. Uh, so Devjan, I'm just talking about Bangladesh because I don't have much information in the Indian side. So uh, 25.1 million people living in moderate poverty. If you don't in, do the Delta Vision and 5.4 million people, when the whole Delta region is the home of 7 million people so far, including India and Bangladesh, the, only the Delta Vision, that bay, they live 7 million. 5.4 million people go extreme poverty. If you don't do it by 2041, if you don't take any action. So that's like very recent update. Now we are seeing Swiss. And they are talking not only protecting the Delta Vision plan or implementing it, but through infrastructure and ecological balance. And they are not talking mostly about displacement or relocating the people. The reason is why to relocate these people. 5.4 million people, Bangladesh has already 160 million people. And inside the city, then why you can put this? Ex and that's number one. Number two, the borderline between Bangladesh area, the West Bengal and Bangladesh in the Shundarbon area, there is no border. People cross the border all the time. And we look exactly same. We talk exactly same language. We eat exactly same food. So who can understand who is Indian, who is Bangladesh? When the displacement or relocation start, who can guarantee that the, this 5.4 million Bangladesh will cross the border and go to West Bengal? Can anybody guarantee that? The, no, no, they'll not go because they have, a, like, they have a sign on the top that this is Bangladesh, you can't go. But, we are exactly look like same. You can't differentiate like who is whom. We talk exactly same language, same thing, or who knows the people from Uzbek will come back to Bangladesh. That's another political challenge. And none of this report, neither WWF, neither ICN, or all bank say this one. So now this would be a big challenge when you think planned relocation or forced displacement. And second part, the same kind, uh, when Dr. Devjan is saying COP26, that's the, uh, the plan for uh, Delta Vision is depending on the investment of foreign countries. I am also by passport as an Australian citizen. And I read a very interesting article the other day that due to Australia-China Cold War, Australia cannot sell his coal to China. Australia is now asking Bangladesh, this, we are so kind to you, we can do lots of development for you. And I don't know why I'm thinking it's true or not, but I'm scared. The word meaning that we will help you your development means we will sell our coal to you because that's the only economy Australia has, selling coal to other country. So I'll do your development. That means I'll sell coal to you. Buy my coal and Bangladesh need the power plant. Bangladesh need the energy for this, at least to feed this 160 million people. They need energy and definitely the energy is not solar panel is not enough uh nuclear power plant is not enough 
we don't have any thermal energy, so only alternative option is coal burning power plant. And when I read this article in Australian News Herald, I that's like my gut feeling. I'm not saying this is true. I don't want this is true, but that's my gut feeling that the saying of this word from Australian Prime Minister to Bangladeshi Prime Minister means something wrong there. So when this goal will come, or say for example, this deal has happened, that could be another threat for Shundarbon. That could be a threat not only for ecological system of Shundarbon, but the people living on that particular area. And because those big ships will come, they will bring the coal or they'll, the waste and the water pollution see acidification and see acidification will kill all the mangrove and it's a, like nuclear cycle it's like how do i say fusion reaction once the coal will come sea outer acidification sea outer acidification will decrease the mangrove decrease the mangrove will affect the people ecosystems are the sustenance at the same time it will increase the cyclone impact even if you try to plan displacement of the people, we can save the people, but we can't save Shundarban. Or if you want to save Shundarban, you cannot save the people. So it's becoming a big loophole, which is completely overlooked. And I'm sure that's why maybe Australia doesn't join the COP26. So they have to promise something. And if they promise something, they may not sell their coal. So that's, and that's why there are completely different direction, the global politics and global business. As Dr. Bajjan is saying, like, we are completely trying to hide something. The whole picture is not there. We are saying ecological perspective. We are saying humanitarian perspective. We are talking ecosystem perspective, but then we are hiding how the global politics playing behind. And if we put all the puzzles together, only that you could might think the Planned or forced displacement, none will work together. We need to find an alternative. And that alternative could be place those people at the same time because uh, that's what my I think in that place those people on the same place because they are there for generation after generation. They know Shundarbun better than any scientist. A yeah, scientist are doing there, they're studying there maybe five years, six years, 10 years, but these people are there for thousand years. This Delta population, that, that was our identity. That's from there we started our whole nations. So these people knows this place better that how to cope with this one. But we are looking from different angle, from political issues, economical issues, uh, humanitarian issues, but we are not thinking how man and ecology could be harmony. And that's missing part is leading us in a different direction. Um, Megna, you have been studying there, you could say more because I studied there in 2009 to 2014 during my PhD. I was there and doing all this. And after that, I'm a little far. I'm just reading the articles, sometimes your publications, sometimes. But that's why I'm still definitely I'm far behind than you two. But that's what my feeling. I'm listening listen articles and I'm, I am afraid. I should say I am afraid. Thank you so very much for giving me the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yazul. Definitely, there's much food for thought. And uh, thank you for that passionate uh, uh, presentation of your views. Thank you so much. So uh, we also have with us Dr. Devujyoti Das, who is joining us from United Kingdom. And uh, he is the you know, principal investigator of the project that I was talking about, about the trans-regional collaboratory in the Indian Ocean region. Uh, so Dr. Das, over to you to share your views. Welcome. Please unmute, Dev. Hello, everybody. I, I don't I don't think I have much to share, but I think Dev Jani and Meghna have made brilliant presentation in terms of the challenges that we are facing in the Sundarban Delta. Um, I think my humble submission will be to kind of uh, look beyond the, what the WWF is doing. They're doing a brilliant job, but I think um, we have to focus on, uh, 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 we have to kind of focus on this whole idea of decolonializing the whole knowledge that we are kind of currently producing. And if you go through that prism, we will realize that we have this kind of understanding of nature and culture from a more convivial kind of relationship that is built by local communities with their natural environment. And if we bring those into perspective in our policy dialogues, in our kind of 
planning processes, I think we can have more equitable and you know uh, just environmental approaches, which would kind of necessarily address the concerns of the subaltern marginalized people in the Sundarban Delta, as Magna and Devjani have already highlighted, that it's predominantly kind of you know are lived by people who are from the you know backward classes and kind of who are from the scheduled caste, and people have also experienced the big trauma of you know partition, and that memory is also there within the minds and hearts of people. And we know very well the people who are staying in the Sundarban are from the most marginalized groups who could not find spaces in kind of places like Kolkata and other urban spaces. So we have to kind of really think about uh, that aspect too. But uh, what I wanted to understand or, or also get more kind of uh, insights from Devjani and Meghna is about what we are currently looking in this project is about the whole idea of migration. And we are also very critical about this, using these terms as environmental refugees, climate refugees, because we don't want to buy this jargon because as Meghna and Devjani have already explained, they are multifaceted uh, kind of phenomena in the sense that people migrate not because of economic reasons, but they also migrate because uh, of it. Uh, other needs uh, and parts they don't migrate and that is also the reason um, that is very important to understand because of the kinship network that people have uh, while i was doing fieldwork in the sundarban i saw after the isla cyclone people have moved out from their villages to other child lands and then they have returned back because those landscapes were inhospitable and they could not kind of cultivate in those landscapes that particularly in Tista River Valley uh, in Siliguri area in, in North Bengal. So it's very important to understand kind of, you know, knowledge of communities as Meghna has mentioned. Uh, we need to kind of acknowledge those knowledge systems and, and at the same time be critical about this whole uh, idea of migration that is currently being kind of discreetly that if people move out of that, as, as Razul has said, kind of, you know, if you depopulate the population or people voluntarily migrate out, do, out of those spaces and they would kind of have a better life. That's not the case. In fact, people kind of become more vulnerable when they move out of their homeland from their homesteads. Uh, so I, I think I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Debujati Das, for your uh, perspectives and also for that throwing out that question, that which is really relevant. So I'd like to invite uh, Devjani and Meghna to sh share their responses to what uh, Dr. Das and Dr. Ehsan had to say. Would you like to take it from here? Devjani, will you go first, um, and and then I'll follow. Okay. So, okay, I am happy to do that. Like, I think you are, like I, I will let Meghna answer much more specifically because she's she's been working there for such a long time about what the, the migration question. I do want to touch upon two points that I think Dr. Esan and Devojyoti uh, raised, and thank you so much for also the work you guys are doing, for also your really really helpful feedback and contextualization and. Thanks for also talking a little more in more detail about the specificities of the Bangladesh Delta vision. So I think uh, two things, I think, uh, I think uh, Dr. Ehsan actually, and I, I guess I can call you Riazul. Riazul actually raised a very good point about what would migration look like in such a contested political climate, like uh, in India and Bangladesh. And as we know, India is instituting NRC, the term Bangladeshi or Bengali has become a really problematic term in India. So we definitely like, uh, definitely like it has become equivalent to, it has become a, a product of a xenophobic politics that we are currently experiencing within that. And I think in some ways, um, uh, I'll just say one line and Meghna is one of the writers. We are uh, doing an entire series on how to think about how to put the climate um, change conversations that's happening in the entire Ganga Brahmaputra Delta in the larger uh, politics of how it's being nestled into the larger and older <coughs> land conflicts that we see that have been happening in the Brahmaputra in Sundarbans uh, on both sides. So we are thinking through this in a much more uh, uh, in a long jure for, uh, which is outside of this uh, climate emergency tunnel vision. And so I think it is a very, very important point. How are we going to understand where people are moving to? How are they moving to? And it's this whole project of economic vulnerab uh, vulnerabilization that will, uh, will happen, but also it will be like political vulnerabilization, social, all kinds. So uh, how do we come up with a plan that actually keeps the people in the center and everything else around it, right? And then we have to maybe curtail our 
energy regimes, curtailed, what is maybe the business as usual that we have used as a way to develop our Delta vision has to be broadened. It has to be not the business as usual in the Delta, but business as usual elsewhere. Because again, again like I think uh, what um, Riazul helped us understand is uh, that Sundar, when we think of the Bangladesh side of the Sundarban Delta, it is the source of livelihood, not just to the people who are living there, but also of the entire Bangladesh. Like it is impossible to imagine. So we really have to bring that in. So thank you very much. And can we, and thank you also for bringing the point of the Australia's developmental selling of coal. Like can we, perhaps we need to admit that COP26 was an absolute failure. There is no hope. And Jimmy, I love the fact that you feel hopeful. I don't feel hopeful. And I do think here, I think of, you know, Carol Fabotko's work on the Caribbeans and who said like about the wishful thinking. It is like at this moment, we as Global South scholars are supposed to feed Global North with hopeful images of adaptation so that they can go on business as usual. So I don't know if, uh, if, the, uh, if adaptation and resilience responsibility lies on the poorest amongst our uh, 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 poorest of the citizens in, in the world. Maybe we need to adapt to a different energy regime, different consumption regime. And wow, what about we turn the picture around and said, let's get people in Texas and Philadelphia to adapt to a different lifestyle so that people in Bangladesh can thrive and flourish. So I'll just rest my case now. Sorry, thank you, Devjani. I caught the last bit of what you said. I my the I cut out for a few moments, and I I think I'm just wanting to um, highlight two points. And thank you again uh, so much, Dr. Hassan, as 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 well as Dev Jyoti for for your insights and inputs here and pushing us in the right direction because. Sometimes the Sundarbans, and actually often it is introduced as a hostile landscape, and that um, you know there's snake bites that abound, small illnesses turn into fatalities. There isn't healthcare, but actually I also want us to rethink what uh, you know whether it really you know the alternative to that hostile landscape is actually much more violent. And I just want for us to highlight, um, and we know this not just during the pandemic and 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 what COVID brought on, but before that, the informal economy in India, with the majority of people like the Sundarbans would go and work in, is for many of whom who have whose lives I've gone to know. And I'd like to give actually one example. And I think early when Tejani and I started having these conversations, I remember her telling her about this very specific case where uh, Rahimda, a particular person who I got to know quite well, uh, had been attacked. Uh, the boat that he was on in the Sundarbans as a crab collector had been attacked by a tiger and somebody on the boat had been taken and died. Um, of course, this shocked him and he uh, stopped crab collecting, left the village, went to first to Bangalore, outside of Bangalore, to um, a garment factory and subsequently for a few years in a construction site in Orissa. And then at the time I was speaking to him, he was back in the Sundarbans, it had been a few years, and back to crab collecting. And he told me um, in those many words that, you know, that was no life. I was away from my family, I was away from my children, he got malaria, he did not get paid the wages that that he was guaranteed. Um, he was living and you know, he said, you know, I didn't like the food, I didn't like the water, it didn't suit me. I um, had, and, and in his words, you know, he said that was not what living was and is. And I will come back to the mouth of the tiger. Um, I, and you know, this is a person who had been on a boat who had been attacked, his, his friend or the other fisherman on the boat had been attacked by a tiger. And he says, I know that, you know, I could be killed again. But actually, um, that form of slow death of living in um, and working in the outskirts of Bangalore, living in a shanty town, was so miserable and so depleting of any kind of life force or vitality. And there he was living at home. He does. He is. He is landless. He has does not have a patta. It's he has you know squatter rights. Um, you know this whole delta vision of him selling his land. There is no land he owns. I mean, he's a fisherman, landless. Um, but but you know, he's home. He's with his three daughters in the village, and uh, he's the last time I visited, he'd saved enough for a brick home, um, and he was you know doing the jungle again, crab collecting. And so I do think that actually, in so many ways, if we're going to 
to make the Sundarban something that can be consumed by urban dwellers as a landscape to you know show children the the sort of what what a forest mangrove forest and a Bengal tiger looks like actually th this is their home and this is a relationship not just to the WWF tiger but uh, as Dev Jyoti and many others have written about of course is there is Dokhin Re there is the tiger demon there are different ways of relating and and preserving um, a relationship to land so I think I'm really pleased for for, for both of you for highlighting what we, we as, as Devjani said, we might have to think about who is forest dependent differently. We are much more dependent on the forest than those people who live alongside it. But we might also have to reconceive the way we talk about whether it is as hostile as the alternative of, of working in sh factory shop floors and construction sites, especially in the context of India or, or, or all of South Asia. So, um, and, I, and I think one thing that I would love for all of us to sort of think about, and I don't have an answer to this, is this question of the border, because it is, as we know, much more of a real border than, uh, I mean, the, the community that I lived alongside were all from Bangladesh, and there was a lot more, Asha, there was a lot more going in and out between family relationships, marriages across the border, because as you said, you know, uh, Dr. Hassan, it's right there, it's all the same, it was the same country, it's the same landscape. But it has become a very hostile, very militarized border with the BSF um, and the Forest Department doing a, a kind of securing national security and the national tiger, you know, together. So this will change now with, oh, I, I mean, change in the sense how will forced migration, forced displacement, and, and, and the challenges of, of the way in which our national governments have basically mil have, have made these borders. Um, so, I mean, we've militarized these green spaces in the words of many other scholars. Uh, we are operating drones. We are operating ways in which actually it is like a war zone. You know, the Sundarbans is not pristine. There are so many ammunitions in that forest that are given to forest guards and to the border security force. Um, so we we have we'll slowly have to think about actually the the threats um, that are not so much about the movement of sea level rise that will displace people. It's also alongside defense, navy, and security regimes um, which are coming into. And in fact, Israeli spyware companies are the ones that are making forest department equipment. So it's it's the the ties between green militarization and a war against biodiversity conservation and defense forces are, are a whole thing that we didn't speak about. But but this will these will be challenges of the future that that hopefully um and, and so yeah just to say that sea level rise is is one challenge but we are we are creating many more um sort of time bombs waiting to explode in this fragile ecosystem yeah i'll end with that yeah, sure Thank you. Thank you, Devjani and Meghna for uh, those responses. It really alludes to several things. And, um, you know, the fact that, uh, um, in fact, one of our uh, participants, Tapish Mondal, has mentioned that any problem of the peoples of the Sundarbans have to be resolved within the Sundarbans. It is not possible to, you know, uh, solve any problems by evicting them. Uh, it is an unrealistic plan. This actually shows the, uh, the, uh, need and the demand of the people, which uh, is perhaps not understood by uh, by the outsiders, and and also as uh, uh, Riazul also mentioned that you know uh, where do we where do we go forward? Like uh, we have to place them there itself. So. Um, basically it is also about representation of people's voices and whether are, are we ready to uh, really listen out to them uh, remains remains a big question so thank you so much for uh, your for your uh, responses and you know uh, dev jenny uh, sorry megna you had mentioned about the labor laws the prevailing labor laws and uh, how important it is because most of them uh, belong to the unorganized sector. So um, recently, the Ministry of Labor and Employment has developed the eShram portal uh, for creating a national database of the unorganized workers, which will be seeded with the Aadhaar. So uh, this may ha this has both pros and cons because once it is seeded with Aadhaar, then it will also have several. Um, uh, you know, it will of course. Um, 
lead to an understanding about their places of uh, origin, their occupation address, educational qualifications, etc. But it is actually said that, um, you know, the, the types of skills that they have, the uh, their prospects of employability and what are the prospects of extending social security benefits to them. So, uh, but uh, because this will be a national database, it will also um, be interesting to understand uh, through a survey or an assessment of its reach in the Sundarbans area, Sundarbans Delta region. Um, and, and also to understand the extent to which it has been successful. Um, it would, while it will be a, definitely a novel policy research and uh, to understand the challenges in the attainment of the goals of the portal, but it would also have implications in addressing the phenomenon of the cross-border security concerns due to illegal migration, which Riazul was also talking about. So, uh, I mean, uh, it is, it is actually um, a situation of flux that we are all in, the people of the Sundarbans are all in. So um, yes, uh, it, it has really been interesting, very, very interesting uh, discussion. And there is a <clears throat> very interesting uh, point that has been raised by uh, Dr. Sas Biswas, who's also uh, watching us over, um, over Facebook, uh, making points, uh, um, Critic, uh, making points very important, uh, making very important points with respect to climate emergency and cost and benefit analysis uh, by the presenters. Um, the suggestion for people's participation is through uh, traditional awareness, traditional methods of micro level pres uh, prescriptive policy. Uh, how do you see uh, in this? And also, um, um, and also, Mr. Ashok Chaudhary has uh, mentioned about about the fact that only 10% are registered and same time all labor rights are taken away unconstitutionally. So there it is, you know, the reality check right here. So uh, would you like to uh, talk about this for a bit? Uh, Meghna De Devjani. Okay, Meghna, do you want me to go? I'll let you talk about the labor thing. That's something you brought up. But yes, so, the, so thank, thanks very much. Uh, you know, like, uh, um, I want to make two points about the border. And I, I was yesterday actually listening to Malini Sur, who wrote this new book called Jungle Passports about the border. And it is exactly what, you know, Riazul, Meghna, Debojuti has been talking about. These are, you know, how do we go beyond thinking about these borders as fixed, as anybody moving across illegal? How do we think of these borders, she's saying, as markets, as sites of exchange, as sites of marriages? And throughout, and her work has shown, you know, like, how do we imagine? And she said, these are moving borders. We do cannot at all, like from the time of the independence, uh, sometimes the rice is a border. In the very early moments after partition, rice got securitized along the Brahmaputra Delta and Assam. Later, it was cattle, and it is now cattle. These are marriage markets. These are garment markets. These are export-oriented markets. How do we have an expansive notion? And once we have an expansive notion, does it perhaps then allow us to rethink the militarization that Meghna brought out during the Q&A? So I think it is good to keep in mind, like, what is it? Like, what, where are we putting our energy? Emo, like, I, I think you use this beautiful uh, phrase, emotional and economic energy to, to do what exactly? Is it a green kind of militarization? Is it, what are the national security concerns? Is human health a secure? What if we said, like, the biggest threat is uh, the lack of education and hospital there? How would our policies look like? I think that is kind of important. I don't know. I've been like reading uh, like with India moving and listening to the work uh, Chinmay Tumbe has been doing about the portal and all of that. And, you know, there are some good things, but there are like, it is like, it is again, these attempts at fixing. So again, like to really bring out the other point very critically, what sort of cost benefit analysis would we have out of a much more regulated, perhaps movement of people but if, if some of the people who have lived in Sundarban in the kind of uh, ecological atmosphere of the Sundarban are now decide to be relocated to Delhi, what would their lives be at this moment, this very day? They would, they, they would have to sacrifice their lungs to survive, to earn money. So what, how do we actually do a cost benefit analysis? How do, where do we put in the, so the threat, I am running away from Tiger and Cyclone to go into AQI 900 uh, pollution level. What am I, what are we talking about actually over here? So like so we have to put all of this in that context. So and ab absolutely the 
bhashan chor uh, like it's another kind of and i think it is very interesting i think uh, i believe uh, jason cohn's work and uh, kasya paprok's work has shown how actually these these kind of communities and bhashan chor being one like that these become actually laboratories of experiments in climate securitization in human rights so we really need to think about like what, where are these kind of experiments in adaptation resilience being played out and worked out and we absolutely right in bringing up bhashan chor as another kind of vulnerability where we can trace the story of climate refugee and migration that all of you are pushing back against wonderful in your work where we can trace the story of ethnic violence and migration where we can trace the story of deep marginalization in the name of human rights um by funded by un and world bank so yeah i thank you devjani i think um i'm i i mean i mean i think in some ways i've said most of what i do in terms of the labor issues and the labor laws i think we know the real i mean so many scholars from jan bremen and and many others from you know decades and generations of writing have written about what um the the precarity of our informal sector uh, is and the kinds of casualties so i think just in terms of deaths and data you know a, a tiger death um is much more sensational however actually just if we look at the numbers of people um you know like look at the garment factories in bangladesh we know we know those stories because you know the new york times and things picked it up but usually just any factory in india any construction site in india does not have the labor safeguards um i think i want to just as the ending kind of thought i think uh, debajyoti da had said in his chat earlier about the the different kinds of stakeholders that one could involve and one should involve in a conversation like um to think about a sort of future of the sundarbans and i in some ways i think it is very important to um have both and and there have been of course attempts but there need to be further attempts and renewed attempts where we we can have a conversation where actually people who live in the sundarbans but also people who are different kinds of experts so there's biologists there's all kinds of scientists there's historians and anthropologists civil engineers mangrove scientists i think we need to be able to actually think about um research um and deep science which is blended with local expertise and local knowledge um and i don't think we have enough of that yet there is a lot of funding that the sundarbans attracts but we for example do not have a basic carrying capacity of fish stock crab uh spawn spawning and breeding patterns what is a sustainable use of the the sundarbans forest for how many um you know fishing boats should be legitimately sustainably fishing um what you know have we studied the health of our rivers based on the toxic fly ash the diesel the coal spills we do not i mean we know we see it we can visually all know it doesn't take that much research to know that this is a problem but we do actually need um there are, there are threats uh, from the kinds of things that they've done in terms of ship breaking has brought up sitting in philadelphia to the entire sort of river system delta system and the ways in which tourism is being allowed to um kind of grow and expand i think there needs to be a kind of concerted effort i i agree um you know this is i i called it a wwf vision because it is actually um really a very narrow vision which has not been there, there's a reason why certain people were consulted and certain people were a part of this conversation and i think one thing as as thinkers scholars activists residents of the sundarbans uh, others we can try and think of a process which is much more collaborative not to say that outside knowledge is is you know it it doesn't have to always be top down and most of us here in this panel are outsiders but it can be a collaboration of sorts where we we allow for different points of view and different expertise and disciplinary knowledge and i think they did it it's right what you say that this this actually has to be a vision which is constructed with the help of bangladesh scholars and residents as well as those in india and i think it 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 is it is possible to have um a vision statement you know 2050 or 2100 who cares but that the idea that it it has to have other points of view which um do not come from um i think 
actually a, an agenda which is very much driven by um, WWF's notions of a particular kind of nature uh, where people's lives are not valued because it is a concept of nature which is devoid of humans. And I think that is deeply flawed and problematic. And that is not the concept of nature that, that a future vision um, should uphold. So yeah, thank you again. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Thank you. So uh, I would like to move to the uh, final uh, concluding round where I would request each of you to present uh, briefly your views on the way forward. Where are we moving towards? Um, uh, in in the how does a future specter look like? But before that, I'd like to also. Um, uh, put this on the table about um, some comments that have come up on Facebook Live. And if you could also address this in passing uh, or in reference uh, towards your in, in your way forward uh, uh, remarks is one is one uh, remark is by uh, Professor Gopa Samanta. She is a professor in University of Bardhavan who, who says that the terms like adaptation strategy and resilience building need to be questioned. If we would really like to understand the indigenous ways, we should rather use the term adjustment, which the people in the Sundarbans perform on a daily basis. And this in the, in the language is a hand to mouth situation. And there is another comment by uh, Chauvinik Roy, who says that the primary issue is lack of trust between state and local communities. Uh, and this makes the situation very complex. Given the number of external agents having high stake in Delta tourism and other degrading practices like brick kiln and shrimp farming. If you could uh, talk about this uh, in, in your concluding observations, that would be great. And I would like to start with uh, Debo Jyoti first uh, as to your views on the way forward. And then we move to uh, Dr. Riazul. So over to you, Debo Jyoti. Thank you, Simi. I think uh, some of the things that we should really think through is one is this whole idea of citizen science, which has had some tradition in South Asia, particularly in Kerala, which can be used to kind of bridge this kind of gap or the mistrust that the big have or kind of uh, the expert knowledge and the technological fixes that we are constantly producing, like in the COP26, like we are talking about, you know, net zero, but we, we very well know that what are the consequences of getting net zero, like we can have electricity vehicles, but where lithium is produced, like let's say in Latin America, what will happen to those communities because already there is a civil war. So not to stretch that far, what I'm trying to say is that we also have to look at the political economy of the place and other one other thing that I found very interesting that came out of this discussion is people's relatedness to their land and which I found very interesting when I was doing my field work in Sundarban, the people who have migrated out of the Sundarban Delta and have kind of resettled in the suburbs of Kolkata, not necessarily in the city, are kind of also celebrating like the Sundarban Day. So they definitely kind of have this kind of collegiality, this kind of you know, understanding that they kind of celebrate that kind of unique kind of relationship that they have built over, you know, past decades. So it's very important to kind of acknowledge that kind of relatedness that people have to their land as indigenous communities have and their identity is shaped by their kind of, you know, by their land. So, so I think these are some of the things that we need to kind of take into consideration. And one final point, I think we need to have trans-regional and trans-boundary research. And we need to kind of, you know, uh, question this whole idea of area studies that has emerged over a period of time. And deltas have been kind of in a way marginalized in these kind of frameworks. And we also have to go beyond this whole idea of nation, nation state kind of ideas of kind of you know, research. So we need to kind of collaborate uh, across board with scholars, different disciplines. Uh, it should be more multidisciplinary. And that I think is very useful to kind of bring in the perspective from different disciplines as this whole has shown that it has been more, more defined by economics and kind of the Malthusian principle. So if you kind of value philosophy, if you value history, if you value other forms of discipline, I think we can have a more richer discussion around these topics. I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Deba Jyoti. I would request uh, Dr. Riazul to share his views. And also, if you could talk about the indigenous <coughs> knowledge as the way for one of the ways forward that you were talking about, that would be great. Over to you. Please unmute. Okay. Before starting my speech, I, I'll share a, my life experience when I was doing this. And I'm going to tell you a story. 
uh, I think some of you understand Bangla. That I'll take one single line in Bangla between the story, but the, when I was going to Shundarbon and we used the launch, we called it in local launch, like the steamer. And there's lots of people there. And there is a one cobbler who polished the shoes, which is very common in the steamer. It's a very young, like quite a strong cobbler there. And then and he says like, uh, can I polish your shoes? You can give me whatever you have. So I said, all right. And he was doing, and then literally I was talking, what are you from? And he's saying, I'm living just in the middle of the Shundarbon. Just from there, and then he do the daily business on the steamer and come. And then I was asking like, I'm going to Shundarbon because we are doing some research so that how can we save the local people or something? That couple look at me, the blank eyes, and I'm saying now Bangla, that means don't go there. Our bon bibi, the goddess of the forest, is more than enough to protect us. You guys don't need to go there. Like, go and invent our life. That was his meaning. So that is a great lesson I learned from him. And Megna, when you are in Shindarboni, you see both the Hindus and Muslims, whatever it is, everybody believes in bon bibi. Bon bibi is the Shindarboni itself. That's the goddess of Bonbi and Shundarbun itself. So that's why my understanding is those local community, they know way better because they are the generation of like thousand years. They know way better how to protect themselves under the shade of Shundarbun. And when we are interventing with our expertise, our knowledge is we are not, we are helping, but rather we are disturbing the whole ecosystem and ecology and the interrelation between nature, human harmony. So we can do a better collaboration with our ideas, our thoughts, our expertise, our knowledge, not only in India, Bangladesh, but all global world. And, but not to intervene in their life, rather observing. Rather observing what, this, what could we do, like when they are surviving their life and how they are doing, learning from them, Rather intervening our idea, finding displacement, replacement, and that will cause harm. That will be seriously. Rather, they know very well. And there's one comment here, like public participation. Uh, perhaps I don't know, Dr. Bishos, you have been there or not. Those people know much, much better than any of us, any of ecologists or scientists, what a Shundarbon is. Because Shundarbon is not only mangrove forest. It's then complete biome. And that biome is completely different. It has a biome of soil water. It has a biome of seawater. It's a biome of fresh water. It's a biome of mangrove forest. It's a biome of natural things. So when 10 different biomes work together, it's hard for the scientists. It's nature can only solve. Like I seems like philosophical talk as a scientist, but I've seen that on that those people know very well. Uh, before stopping, Dr. Devajuti, I really had a fight this morning with another researcher about COP26. They said, it's very hopeful. I said, no, it's not. Because Korean government, President Moon promised that by 2050, they will reduce 35% of carbon emission. By 2050, they're almost going to net zero. But you, perhaps you know the Korean carbon footprint is all number one because they are highly consuming society, Samsung. LG, perhaps you don't know that LG makes shampoo. Have you ever seen LG shampoos in the market? In Korea, they are. Sha Samsung has shampoo shampoos and conditioners. We, they don't sell it outside, but this is within Korea. So they are like consuming market. And for doing this, surviving this one, they need energy. And electric energy, solar power, or wind energy is not enough to survive Samsung itself. Forget about uh, LG. And it, the one good idea, LG and Samsung is very small company in Korea. Many of us, you don't even, I don't know. I thought Samsung is used. No, this is POSCO. POSCO is a Korean government funded company. All the international development projects, they run it. And they need coal power power plant. And when POSCO need coal burn power plant, how they promise by 2030, 2050 will be 35% reduce our carbon emission. So it's promise make promises. Promise doesn't bring actions. So I, Dr. Shiranjana, you are there. I'm sorry, but I'm going to 
there was the other side, uh, Devjani said, I am not hopeful. So, yes, I'm finishing here. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you, Riazul, for those uh, concluding thoughts. Thank you so much. Uh, so I would like to invite uh, Meghna to share her views. Final uh, concluding thoughts, Meghna. Thank you. Yeah, I, I mean, I think I, I the, sort of said my concluding thoughts earlier, but just in, um, I think Devjani and I often discuss this when we have our conversations um, on various themes and we, we keep thinking and hoping that actually there is a lot of um, creative thinking possible and that energy is not necessarily um, that thought, whether it's you know emotional labor, intellectual labor, and of course the finances as well and money, it you know if you look at New York, New York will also um, every part of the world, every big city in the world will also be affected by sea level rise. But the just the sheer amount of funding and um, energy in thinking again, as Devjani has mentioned, and you know she talks about the race and class issues. Of course, it's never equal and there are parts of you know you know the poorer parts of New York are not but I think just if there can be a little more energy in terms of how one can think about alternative solutions um, to better life both human and non-human in the Sundarbans I think it has not in some ways made it onto um, the global map as an important place for people to invest in um, and for that reason, we don't, you know, we're still making Indra Avas homes which do not suit the landscape. We're still making embankments which are not possibly designed for um, the, the, the ecological specificities of this delta. There are small, there are things that we could do. There are things that should just be possible. There should be better healthcare. There should be um, designs of homes and of ways of protecting, which is, it's not rocket science. It actually requires some civil engineers, mangrove scientists, a few sociologists who know land patterns to come together and, and create what might be not the best, but better than what we have right now, which is a one size fits all brick home given by the government and the roof blows off because because it's a tin roof, which does not suit the cyclonic winds. I think I'm not an architect or a designer, but those that are, perhaps the Sundarbans can be a place alongside other anthropologists and historians to come up with small solutions, which are actually deeply significant, um, alternative forms of agriculture. So I think, you know, from paddy to livelihoods, to fishing protective equipment, to the homes and embankments. There are about many ways in which we could think to improve lives in small ways. Um, and this is both, you know, again, I repeat human and non-human life. So I, I think there are possibilities. It is hopeless, but actually there are many small things one could do which would really improve um, people who are living in the Sundarbans today. And it's, it's, it is an injustice as Devjani put it, that what if we were to make healthcare a priority. Um, and, and so I think, yeah, on an ending note, perhaps the possibilities of small creative changes of just thinking and having people with different skill sets, um, blending in local knowledge. And again, you know, indigenous knowledge in some ways, I think the Abjani and also have these discussions where it would be really fabulous if they could have access to some of the science journals you and I have access to in Bangla. So, you know, they all have smartphones, there's WhatsApp now, and there's a lot of people who read and write, and actually they would be much better off in knowing you know, tidal management systems and the Ganga Brahmaputra Delta's geomorphic qualities. And then say, actually, I know how to make this embankment having read something in a science journal in Bangla and I get it. We need to be able to make knowledge. We need, we need more translators. And I, I don't say this just in terms of the language, but mediators between the expertise that outsiders do bring as well as 
local knowledge because they've been living there and we haven't and we don't know in the ways that they do. So I think as a way forward, small things, um, translating knowledge into Bangla that can be circulated on WhatsApp and having a lot of people think about small solutions that might improve lives in a very significant fashion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Devjani, over to you. First, I'll begin by just thanking Semi for bringing us all together. This was, I learned so much from talking to everyone. And this was a really, really good discussion. Me and Meghna have been in many of these kinds of discussion, but I think this was a discussion we felt like we could delve down deep and think through what was, uh, what are the way, what are the questions that we need to discuss? I don't think I have much to add with, uh, it's already like Debo Jyoti, you said so wonderfully, we need more citizen science and how do we do it? Like, what do we do? And I think Riazul, you spoke about, you know, we often look at indigenous people as forest people as, you know, often a threat to, often an obstruction to our plans. And we need to turn that around. Like, and, like, and I think what you, the beautiful story you said, stay out. Like, what, and I think uh, Shobhanik Roy said, how do we develop trust? And we have to ask, what have we done in the last hundred years to right. develop trust? Right. What have we done? Have we done anything? So where do we begin by building and developing trust? Meghna, I, I really like what you said about you know, the small, like how do we move away from these gigantic plans and think about small? And I think I like the term Dr. Shamonto put out, adjustment, which is happening on a daily basis, moving away from adaptation and resilience. And, you know, in one way, one of the things I, and I think I have been saying one of, in one of the articles Meghna and I wrote, and I said, oh, what if we did a planned retreat of, it was a thought experiment, but in a, in a kind of a tongue in cheek, but also like a satire does work. We said, what if we did a planned retreat of the Faraka barrage, which has been a resounding failure and how it would actually transform. Of course, we know we cannot do that, but we do, I think, have a chance to, if we want to think about adjustments, adaptation, what if the adaptation began in our Calcutta homes, in our, you know, upper class homes where we reduced the use of plastic, we rethought how we consume what what how, how do why don't we ever think of adaptation on the people who are economically and socially actually capable of certain kinds of adaptation like uh, giving up a certain forms of usages won't affect our livelihood but we always expect resolution resilience and adaptation come from the from the poorest of the poor in our society so i think like what if the adjustments began in a very different context what if the talk about Sundar, making Sundarban a place where people can thrive and have their livelihoods has to begin uh, by transforming the lifestyles of people in Calcutta, Delhi, Philadelphia, where I, you know, all of our lives in some ways. So I think, um, I think that has been very affirming in this conversation. And this is what I take uh, from them. Thank you so much to uh, IMPRI and Simi and Dr. Kumar for bringing us together. This was really, really wonderful and useful conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Devjani, for, uh, for those thoughts. And uh, we really value this. And actually, uh, to, uh, it, it has really been very, very productive uh, discussion indeed. And uh, lots of important views have been exchanged and uh, passionate views, uh, passionate discussion has followed. So uh, I would like to formally end with the uh, formal vote of thanks on behalf of the Imbri Center for Climate Change and sustainable oh, development. I just like one quick word. Yes, yes, please. Thank you so much. It's almost 12 a.m. Yes. I never enjoy such a nice talking. So I didn't even feel, because I was thinking like it's 12, I should, it's just so exciting. Thank I was actually so wanting, much. It was yeah, so, yeah. so yeah. excited. I was like, Thank you, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Riazul, really. Your presence really added to the richness of the discussion. I was actually about to say this. So thank you so much. I hope that, um, we will be able to continue this uh, conversation on the uh, problems and prospects and how we bring together a platform for interdisciplinary research and voices of uh, people, how we represent the voices of the people at the grassroots level. So I hope that we have your support and we continue to discuss this uh, in, the, in the coming months and years. So I wish you all a very good day. Good, good night to you, Riazul. Good day to uh, Devjani and uh, Devu Jyoti and good night to Meghna. And thank you very much uh, on behalf of IMPRI Center for Environment, Climate Change and Sustainable Development to all the participants who really uh, had their proactive participation in the, um, through chat box uh, and also here on Zoom and also on Facebook Live. Your comments really added 
to the richness of the discussion. And I'm sure all the panelists would agree to it. So thank you so much. And I wish you, please stay safe. Take care of uh, yourselves. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you, you so thank much. You. Bye. 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 Bye.